right? Well, Sally's going to start, but let me just say I had a Baptist grandfather who used to say we have to get to church early so we get a good seat near the back. Uh, there are lots of seats up front. Nobody a, ever there's rows of seats up front. Somebody, you know, be, be, be brave. You can do it. Come on and join us yeah. uh, and sit up front. Sally? It's a, it's a group dynamic thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, nobody sits up front. Vestigial from school, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, as a biographer over, over nearly three decades, I've written about business leaders and political leaders and all of whom carried out their roles with um, different bases of power, and they used various strategies to achieve their goals and exercise leadership. Uh, for Bill Paley, that meant using his instincts and his uh, financial expertise to build the CBS network, creating an image for his com company while carefully cultivating his own imperial persona and designating as his second-in-command Frank Stanton, who had vision as well as keen business skills and who could be his tough-minded enforcer. For Jack Kennedy, it meant generating intense loyalty among those around him, keeping his emotions close to the vest, always having multiple lines of information, compartmentalizing his life, keeping his friends and associates slightly off balance, and making sure he had trustworthy men, above all else, his brother Bobby, who was really a de facto <laughs> vice president, to knock heads together. Bill Clinton was very much in the mold of Lyndon Johnson. I was amused to read his review of the, jo of the latest Caro book this past weekend in the New York Times. You could feel that identification. Um, as a leader, he, uh, as president, he was instinctive, he was emotional and skilled in his ability to manipulate others to his ends. Bill Clinton's Bobby Kennedy was his wife, Hillary. But because of the stresses and strains of their marriage, it was a fraught relationship for everyone in the White House. <laughs> well, Queen Elizabeth is a very different sort of leader. There is, in fact, no one like the Queen. She lives in her very own remarkable world. She does not carry a passport. She doesn't have a driver's license, although one of her cousins told me that she drives like a bat out of hell on the private roads of her country estates. She can neither vote nor appear as a witness in court, and she can't change her faith from Anglican to Roman Catholic. She is not elected, and she has no real power. She reigns rather than rules with a commitment to serve until death. Those holding the power, the prime ministers who lead the government when their party achieves a parliamentary majority, come and go, while the queen endures as the hereditary head of state. Although she lacks the power to govern, she has a fascinating sort of negative power. Because she is there, no prime minister can be number one. So many people have asked what surprised me most about the Queen. Well, in her official role, I'd have to say it is her range of duties, her sheer dedication and professionalism, and how she leads in that absence of power. Because she's not like the rest of us, she must keep a delicate balance at all times. If she seems too mysterious and distant, she loses her bond with her subjects, and if she seems too much like everybody else, she loses her mystique. What is most important is that she be reassuring, consistent, and predictable, serving as a unifying force, setting an example through her wise conduct, and being scrupulously neutral. At 86 years of age, two decades past normal retirement age, she still does over 400 engagements a year, Every day, except Christmas and Easter, she spends several hours reading government documents such as classified intelligence reports, foreign office cables, budget documents, and minutes of her prime minister's cabinet meetings. The amount of information she has accumulated over six decades is hard to imagine. But she has used it prudently in exercising her right to be, very specifically, consulted, to encourage and to warn when she meets with government officials as well as senior military officers, members of the clergy, 
diplomats and judges in confidential private audiences. The most important of these encounters have been the weekly audiences with her 12 prime ministers. From Winston Churchill to David Cameron, they have all relied on her wisdom and experience. Because she is above politics, she absorbs information without the filter of ideology. And she has spent so much time meeting people in all corners of the United Kingdom as well as around the world that she has an understanding of what the normal human condition is. Her prime ministers know that they can rely on the queen to tell them what people are thinking and what they care about. Her influence behind the scenes in the corridors of power is very difficult to quantify, but it is real. But in public, the queen influences through her example by setting a high standard of service and citizenship, by rewarding achievement, and by diligently carrying out her role. People may disagree with the monarchy, but it is hard to dispute that her life has been dedicated to serving her people, or that, as Tony Blair, her 10th prime minister, once observed, she is the best of British. Wow. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Um, it's, it's really gratifying for me to be here to celebrate 826 both DC and with you here, 826 National and the whole organization. Because what 826 does is it connects creativity to our lives. It helps people who don't often have all those opportunities to learn how to write, be creative, and sort of understand the miracles of imagination and innovation. And all of the books I have written have been about that intersection between imagination and business or technology. Uh, those of us, uh, you know, in this room probably know a lot of smart people. And you realize after a while that smart people are a dime a dozen. They don't often amount to much. What matters is being imaginative, creative, and innovative. And that's what 826 does by saying you can write, you can be something. But it's also what each of the people I've written about all the people I've written about, has set them apart, which is that ability to stand at the intersection of the arts and technology, or the arts and business. When Steve Jobs first called me and asked me to do a biography of him in 2004, um, it took a while to get started. I had just done a biography of Ben Franklin and was about to publish one on Einstein. And so I thought, OK, Franklin, Einstein, you, Steve. Um, you know, <laughs> humility is not your greatest virtue. But I realized after a while, first of all, that he was fighting cancer, but that his creativity had uh, been part of the American creation myth writ large. Somebody who had started a firm in his parents' garage and made it the most valuable company on earth. Also somebody who, through creativity and innovation, had transformed, not just done good technology or good business, but totally transformed seven or eight industries. And that includes, you know, the personal computer, which until he and Waz said, hey, you can take one of these home and make it your own computer, the personal computer didn't exist. All the way through transforming music and the music industry with iTunes and the iPod, transforming retail stores with... Uh, transforming the way we use telephones, tablet, computers, publishing. So that type of innovation and creativity was uh, what made him stand out to me. So I tried to find in his narrative what were the things that made him so creative. Uh, first of all, I think it was a certain passion and intensity for beauty. Creativity mattered. You know, when he was, and even as a temperament of an artist, knowing that the unseen things have got to be beautiful. When he was about seven years old, he and his dad were building a fence around the backyard of their house. And his father said to him, we have to make the back of the fence just as beautiful as the front. And Steve said, well, why? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And his father said, but you will know. And Steve said, from ever that point on, I always believed that I wanted to stand at the intersection of beauty and product. Somebody who believed that beauty and creativity uh, mattered. For example, when they're building the first Macintosh in early 1980s, 
it's a very sealed machine because Steve is a control freak being an uh, artist that way. Uh, and at one point he looked at the circuit board and he said to the engineers, you know, this sucks. It's ugly. It's an ugly circuit board. So what do you mean? He said, well, the chips aren't beautifully lined. And they said, but Steve, you've made this such a closed case, nobody will ever be able to see it. You can't open the Mac. Nobody will ever know. And he said what his dad had said to him, which is, yes, but you will know. And they held up shipping that machine for a month or a month and a half until they had the circuit board looking just beautiful. And then Steve had them all sign a little board, a little poster board, so that they could engrave their names, all 31 members of the Macintosh team with Stephen P. Jobs right in the middle, engrave it on the inside of the case uh, where nobody would ever see it. Nobody knows that, that if you open an old Mac, you'll see the names of the engineers signed. But he said, real artists sign their work. If you care about beauty and creativity, you sign your work. And so we are going to. And I think that's what set Apple apart for all of Steve's uh, high-maintenance personality. That's what set him apart, was that thing that you do every day at 826, which is say, you can imagine, you can read, you can write, you can be creative. You're an artist. That's what Steve saw in his life. He also believed that you know, simplicity was a part of great beauty and art. He came to the Aspen, Amy and I work at the Aspen Institute. He came there in the early, late 1970s, the Aspen Design Conference, and saw the Bauhaus design, you know, that sort of unbelievable simplicity of Mies van der Rohe and Herbert Beyer. And so everything he did, he said, let's simplify it, let's make it easier. Which in a world, as Einstein once said, where you know, any damn fool can make something more complex, it takes a genius to make it simpler, this is a part of creativity and innovation to me. So to take one example, when they were doing the um, iPod, I think it actually started when he and Wozniak dropped out of college and were working at Atari. Those of us who are old enough to remember the old Atari, Atari video games know they had to be simple enough. Simplicity was part of them. They had to be simple enough that a stone freshman could figure them out after midnight. <laughs> so the instructions were always insert quarter, avoid Klingons. But the same thing is true of everything Steve Jobs created. You've never read an, a manual for how to use an iPod or an iPhone or anything. It's intuitive. So when they're doing the iPod, he said, no manuals. You've got to get to every song you want in three clicks. It's got to be intuitive. You've got to feel it's exactly right. So they build the machine. You know, it's beautiful. It's sort of that wonderful white box. Just that track wheel. And you can feel imaginatively, creatively, how to get there because he's emotionally connected with you. And after they've done it, and he's finally satisfied, you get to everything in three clicks. He says, what's this? It's a little button on the top. And they're scared to answer him because they all know he knows what it is. And finally, somebody's brave enough to say, uh, Steve, that's the on-off button. So Steve says, excuse my language, what the fuck does it do? And they're scared to answer. Finally, somebody says, uh, Steve, it turns it on and off. And he says, well, why do we need it? And it slowly dawns on them, you don't need a big old on-off switch on top of an iPod. If you quit using it, it slowly powers down, gradually gets less and less powered. If you start using it, it powers up. He says, get rid of it. And it was that sort of think out of the box, innovation and creativity that set him apart from Bill Gates, who's building the Zune at that point. Uh, I also found it in so many of the other people I wrote about, this notion of creativity and passion for product. You know, for um, Einstein, it was really a curiosity. He said, I'm not smarter than the other people around me. I just happen to be more curious. Now, that's not, of course, true. He did master the being able to fake humility better than Steve Jobs did. He actually was smarter than everybody else. But he was also more curious. I mean, when he was that same age as um, Steve, you know, um, seven years old, his father gave him a compass. And he said, it just, I became so curious. Why does the needle keep pointing north? Whenever you turn it, the ne nothing is touching the needle. There's no physical thing touching the needle. Why does it point north? And he said, I walked out into the forest and I kept using it. And uh, I was you know, mesmerized by what, what does this. Now, you and I remember getting a compass when we were like seven. And we go, wow, cool, needle points north. And a minute or two later, we're on to something. You know, oh, look, a dead squirrel. And we're, we forgot all about the compass. <laughs> Throughout his life, including on his deathbed, he is writing equations to try to figure out how does a force field work. 
what is it about an electromagnetic field? And he's curious about, gets so curious about, he says, he reads about Maxwell's equations, which define a force field. And he says, you know, if you look at Maxwell's equations, he's 17, he says, you look at Maxwell's, or if you're Einstein, you look at Maxwell's equations. They say the field, the light beam, whatever it is, has to travel at the speed of light. Constant speed, no matter which way you're coming towards it, away from it. He said, that doesn't make sense. What if I could catch up with the light beam? Wouldn't I be traveling alongside it? Same way. He said, I was so curious about that, I walked around in the forest with my palm sweating. Now, I remember what was causing my palms to sweat at age 17. It wasn't Maxwell's equations. But this is that sort of curiosity that keeps a guy like that alive. Franklin had that as well, which is what you're trying to instill in these after-school programs. It's curiosity. But, you know, Franklin, when he was 17, he runs away too. All three of my characters run away at age 17, which is not good for me giving college speeches. But... <laughs> Um, Franklin goes over to England to buy fonts, just like Steve Jobs became fixated with the beauty of fonts, so did Franklin. So he wants to buy fonts so he can be a printer after he's run away from Boston, gets to Philadelphia, sails over to England to become a printer and buy the fonts. Um, But he's told by the ship captains, he's always learned that it takes a day less to get to England than to come back. They can't figure out why, because the winds don't explain it, the rotation doesn't. And so that whole time he's dipping barrels and buckets into the ocean, measuring the water temperature, because people have told him about some mysterious thing. He's able to discover the Gulf Stream and be the first person to map it, just as a kid, because of that curiosity. So those are the things that when we were talking about leadership things, those are the things I was able to extract uh, from the people I know. But for Franklin, and this is also part of the lesson of 826 D.C., or 826 National, his biggest lesson to us, I think, was the notion of tolerance, the notion that we're all in this together, that, you know, he had run away from Boston, which was a very theocratic, you know, structured place, to Philadelphia, where there's Moravians and Jews and Anglicans and Catholics and whatever, and they all work together on places like Market Street, where Franklin set up his print shop. And so he was very good at understanding the virtue of compromise. Uh, He does it religiously. For example, in the Declaration of Independence, when Congress appoints a committee to write the declaration of why they're fighting for independence, it's a committee that has, you know, Franklin, Jefferson, and John Adams. Probably the last time Congress appointed a good committee. But this is an awesome committee. And you just see in Franklin's editing, those of us who have been editors, it's kind of cool to watch an editor be able to actually do something useful, which is, you know, Jefferson starts that sentence in the second paragraph with, we hold these truths to be sacred. And you see Franklin's printer's pen with the black backslashes saying we hold these truths to be self-evident because he says we're not depending on the strictures of religion. We're trying to create a new type of society where our rights come from rationality, the consent of the governed, and the consensus of a variety of people of different religions. And then you see it goes on and says and they're endowed with certain inalienable rights, and there's John Adams endowed by their creator. And so you see the balance they do in trying to get this right. Likewise, at the Constitutional Convention, they're fighting big state, little state issue, and Franklin comes up with a proposal. Let's have a House and a Senate and compromise. Uh, and, you know, he's one of those people who exemplifies what Senator Regal and I were talking about earlier tonight, which is we used to have a Senate that understood that forming these common grounds and compromises, that's what America was all about. As Franklin said, compromises may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. And so that, too, was part of the genius of innovative people and what we're trying to do with A26. It lasted for all of them all their lives. I'll just end with this, you know, in the end. You know, in the end, um, you know, take Einstein, He's had a hemorrhage. He's in Princeton. They bring him to the hospital. They say he refuses to have an operation. He has two or three days to live. He says, bring me my papers from the institute there. And he's sitting there on his deathbed, just writing line after line. I went to Hebrew University because I wanted to see it. Line after line of equations with math mistakes, crossing them out. Still trying to get us one step closer to that mystery of why does the needle twitch and point north? What happens if you catch up with life? You know, trying to get the unified field theory. That will explain the relation of force fields to physical objects. And it finally tapers off at the very end where he, you see him dying, really. 
but he's still writing, and the last line tapers off as he writes one last equation to get us closer to that thing that drove his curiosity. As for Franklin, he donated to the building fund of each and every church built in Philadelphia during his lifetime. And at one point, they were building a new hall. It's still called the New Hall. If you look at Independence Hall, it's right to your left. And it, it was for itinerant preachers, the visiting preachers of the uh, Great Awakening. He said even, he wrote the fundraising document that said, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send somebody here to teach Islam to us and preach to us about Muhammad, we should offer a pulpit and listen for we might learn. And on his deathbed, he's the largest individual contributor to the Mikve Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. So when he died, instead of his minister accompanying his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests of Philadelphia linked arms with the rabbi of the Jews to march with him to the grave, which is that type of tolerance and inclusiveness that they were fighting for back then and we're still fighting for. And as for Steve, I had a very emotional experience last summer when all of a sudden I realized, and he realized, that he was not going to stay a step ahead of cancer and he was dying. And I remember, you know, sitting with him in the backyard and asking him, because we were talking about education reform and other things, what's the meaning of all this? He said, well, you know, there's a big flow of history and I think my Zen Buddhist training has taught me that the journey is a reward. We all take things out of the flow of history. We should try to put beautiful <laughs> things back into it. I said, do you still believe in God and spirituality and the afterlife like you did uh, as a Buddhist and as a Lutheran growing up? So yeah, I like to. I like to believe that something lives on after you're gone, that your experiential wisdom continues and all the good and things you've done are part of the spirit that lives on. He said, but you know, sometimes I worry that maybe it's just like an on-off switch and you die and click, you're gone. And I was kind of taken aback and I just stared at him for a second. And then he gave me that half smile that he sometimes gives and he says, Maybe that's why I didn't like to put on-off switches on Apple devices. <laughs> so anyway, that's the story of the three passions and the three people that I got to write about. So I don't know, Sally, do we want to open it up or, yeah, well, or it's question funny, each other? I, well, I don't know. We're supposed to go back and forth, I guess, a little yeah, bit. Okay. But, but <laughs> I, was, I was struck um, when you were talking about Steve Jobs and, and his approach to, you know, his creativity and, 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 and his insistence on his, his own creative vision. Mm -hmm. And hearkening back to CBS, which was, um, which was somewhat singular for, um, for, for having a real sense of what its, what its corporate image Haley was, was like. Haley was very similar to Steve Jobs. Well, in some respects, I think he was. I mean, the, you can't look at CBS without considering the partnership of Paley and Stanton. And they each had very specific talents. Um, Paley was interested in the overall very, very classy image of the network. But when you were, when you were talking about what a perfectionist yeah. Steve Jobs was in terms of, of the design of his products, it was really Frank Stanton who was the perfectionist. You know, we're all, we all know the CBSI. Well, I cannot tell you how many iterations mm -hmm. that CBSI went through. And his design director wanted a CBSI with a cloud going through it. And Frank Stanton said, nope, it has to be incredibly simple. Great. And that simplicity is going to be the beauty of the image of CBS. And... Um, and he was the real design maven. He's the one who built Black Rock, which is one of the great... Um, Who's the know, architect? Eero Saarinen. Oh, yeah. And, wow. Just a um, great building. And, it, and there was one funny moment when they were trying to figure out what it was going to be made of. And Frank Stanton went up to, um, went up to, to uh, New England, I think it was New Hampshire, to find this very specific kind of granite of a certain gray color. And he was very excited because it was perfect in his vision and Saarinen's vision. And then ba uh, Bill Paley, whose wife, Babe, was incredibly fashionable, said, no, 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 it has to be pink. And pink rock. <laughs> pink rock. And, it, and he spent, uh, Stan spent a fair amount of time trying to, trying to talk him out of that. But, um, <laughs> but, but you're right, that, that, that combination of detail and great vision, which is Paley's stance. Yeah, I mean, 
One thing, it was interesting, David Sarnoff, who was the great pioneer who founded NBC, felt that Paley was not a visionary, that he did not, he was not a believer in pure ideas, which is really kind of the mm. fundamental part of being a visionary. And it is true that Paley had to see something before he could understand how it could be applied. Um, Sarnoff had a vision for the future for broadcasting. Stanton, to some degree, was more of a visionary. Believe it or not, he's, he's mm. been portrayed as a technocrat. But it was Stanton who saw the future of television and came up with a five-year plan for how they would roll television out. Paley had no interest in it mm. because he wanted to. He wanted all. He, he saw all his stars. They were all radio people, yeah. and he wanted also. He wanted to milk radio as long as he could. He didn't want to spend the money on television. But it was an interesting moment because it was Stanton who was really pushing the future and, and Paley who was reluctant to, in part because he, I mean, he knew it was coming, but he wanted to hold it back as long as he could. You know, that raises some interesting points. You and I both worked with Jeff Bukas in the old days, back when he was at HBO. He now runs Time Warner. And he said to me about Steve Jobs that there's some great leaders who are really good at the big picture and the vision. And there's some who are incredibly good at the details. And Steve did both. That, Which is uh, highly unusual. Unusual. The yeah. only other person, forgive me for saying it in uh, oh, this room, is uh, Henry Kissinger, who, you know, whatever you may have thought of some of his policies, take Syria and the Golan Heights disengagement, he is somebody who saw this huge geopolitical vision of what will happen if we get Russia to do this with us on arms talks, but connect it to them getting Syria to do this, as part of a greater Middle East strategy. And so he saw the geopolitics of why Syria could be weaned and Russia could help and you could do a Golan Heights disengagement. But he also did a shuttle mission back and forth from Damascus to Jerusalem for, I think, you know, 41 days. And he knew every tree, every park, every street in the Golan Heights so that he could do the details, which is something that's been missing, I think, you know, in Bill Middle East policy. Could do that. Bill Clinton is another Bill Clinton, strategist in detail. Yeah, I mean, when they were having, you know, when they were having the talks at Camp David, people who were negotiating with him marveled that he could see, he could, he could see the map. He could visualize all the parts of it in ways that nobody else could do it. He had that holistic approach to and the problems. detail I mean, and he would the detail. stay up till 4 a.m. yeah and, just, and he would know what was going on in this little sector and that little sector and what that meant to Yasser Arafat and you, you know, know who was like that was Holbrook yeah a great strategist I guess he was, but he knew detail but he knew the but, details but Clinton is obviously I mean and it, you've written about interesting characters but he's off the charts so tell us about uh uh, Which no, part? Well, no, I meant about <laughs> the ability to compartmentalize, see the big structure, but also yeah. deal with the details. He was. I wrote something down because I thought it was one of the most um, fascinating things that was that was that was told to me about Clinton, and it was from somebody who had known him for very many years, and he said. He, he was capable of constant emotional scans of everyone in the room in real time. While he was thinking, he could recognize, quantify, and calibrate a response to the emotional state of the person with him. And that is quite an extraordinary It sounds ability. like actually a passage from his mother's book, even though it isn't. But his mother said something about he could walk into a room of 100 people. Yeah. 99 loved them, and he knew exactly why, but he also could find that one person who didn't. Well, that was the other, that was the other but this was, this was slightly separate from that. I mean, he could walk into a room, and he could identify the person. I mean, it is, it is the, the, it's the kind of offshoot of that. Yeah. He could identify the person who he just sensed was again him. And, you know, if the meeting was breaking up, he would chase that person down the street and try and persuade him. Because <laughs> he had a neediness, too. Oh, well, yeah. has a neediness. Has, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, and I... And uh, that was all part of his, in, I mean, he, you know, he, big brain, but incredible <laughs> in, intuition. When you look at people. smart people, I've often noticed that they're sometimes on a spectrum from being very analytic and sometimes not great in emotional intelligence. And you'd put uh, Bill Gates or Larry Summers as the greatest analytic intelligences, but not... Zero emotional yeah, intelligence. And on the other extreme, 
to me was Bill Clinton, but also Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve Jobs intuitively knew how to emotionally connect with people. He was not a great programmer, analyst, you know, somebody who, yeah. he said, when I went to India as a 17-year-old dropout, I decided that Western rational analytic calculating thought was not as good as intuitive emotional thought. And yeah. that's what I took away from India. And even in the way he took out a design patent on the way you open the box for the iPod, and it's cradled there like a gym, he said, I knew how to emotionally connect to people. So, you know, when your subject, Princess Diana, dies, there's this emotional outpouring. That's somewhat understandable. But you have almost the same emotional outpouring when a multi-billionaire maker of tech products dies yeah. and people are building, instead of candles in the wind, they're doing iPods and the iPads in the wind and, you know, doing it. And I think it was because of that emotional connection that Diana, Bill Clinton, and Steve Jobs were able to make. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Although I think in the case of Diana, it was it was they it it was it was much more raw emotion, almost irrational emotion. I mean, I was in London. I got there on mm -hmm. the Friday after she died, and it it was. I mean, it was unlike anything you could ever imagine happening in Britain because here were people keening and hugging and over somebody they didn't really know. Right. And who had, yes, she had uh, empathized with people. She had um, given, lent her name to a lot of charities and helped them raise money. But in terms of her contribution to society, it was rather... <laughs> right. No, it was an um, odd you know, emotional outpouring, yeah. but it was pure emotion. It wasn't rational, it was, is what it, I was saying. It was pure emotion, and it and it and it, and it I think had its roots in, in in her vulnerability and her this kind of combustible combination of beauty and vulnerability, and um, somehow a ma you know a massive sense that she she was aggrieved and. And, um, One of the greatest things about your Queen Elizabeth book, which is just an awesome book, and I hope everybody reads it, um, was her, if I remember correctly, reading this, you can correct me, her taking a little while, a couple of days, to figure oh, yeah. out what's happening. Should I, I where was she, Balmoral? Well, or? she was, yeah, I mean, and you probably all saw the, or a lot of you probably saw the movie The Queen, which kind of got it half no. right. But um, I only read your book. I have not seen the movie. <laughs> but, uh, but she was... You know, she was, and believe me, I've been up to, to Balmoral, and it is like Brigadoon. You're 500 miles away from London, and you sort of have no idea what's going on there, even though she was getting briefings from her people on the ground. And they were actually making all the right decisions. They were doing a very unconventional uh, funeral for Diana. Um, they were sending the, all their recommendations up to, up to Balmoral, and she was signing off on everything instantly. She was very decisive, you know, just completely trusted her people in London to do the right thing. But she failed to understand the mood on the streets, which was, you know, which was bizarre. I mean, for, for a time it was very angry, and by the end of the week it, sh it shifted. But, and it, it was an odd and ironic circumstance that if she, you know, over the course of her life, if there was one criticism that was consistently um, uh, made of her, it was that she always put her duty before her family. And uh, as a consequence, her children may have suffered. In this instance, she put her family before her duty, if you consider her duty to be to return to London immediately and, and comfort the millions of people who were pouring in and grieving. Instead, she devoted all of her attention to her two grandsons who had just lost their mother in the most horrific fashion. So her main, her main um, purpose was to comfort them, to keep them in a familiar uh, environment where they were happy or relatively happy, where they could come to terms with things, be with their family, and also to, to prepare them for this amazing uh, public spectacle that they were going to have to participate in, all of which I happen to think was absolutely right. But the tabloids, who play a huge part in this, um, in the days, in the immediate days after the death, they were the subject of everybody's ire. People were shouting at them when they spotted them in the parks, and they were saying, this is your fault. 
And so they... I'm talking about the paparazzi particularly? Well, even the tabloid reporters, okay. everybody, yeah, all I of them, editors, talk, yeah. the whole lot. And they very swiftly um, pivoted. pivoted. They made the pivot the queen. to the queen and I what she's doing up there. Book, yeah. and, um, and, point in the book. and she, um, you know, there was a big to-do over the flag with the empty flagpole over Buckingham Palace, which according to tradition, had to be empty if the queen wasn't there. But, you know, they took that as a great affront, not having anything at half-staff to recognize Diana. And so um, finally she realized, sort of by Thursday of that week, that what she was doing was beginning to damage the monarchy. One of the um, great themes of your book... And she very quickly turned it around and made some very intuitive and and smart moves. One of the great themes of your book is leaving that case aside, the notion of duty yeah. that we've kind of lost in this uh, era of when you list virtues. Uh, Benjamin Franklin would list duty, yes. and fealty, and honor. Right. But duty is a lost virtue, and I think that's the charm of your or not the charm, that minimizes it. The, the, the greatness of your book is that it reminds us that duty is a virtue. It does, and, and a lot of other things that she, that she stands for, steadfastness and um, conscientiousness and, and um, you know, at 86 years of age, still doing 400, uh, in, you know, engagements a year. But, yeah, I think it's that, it is that duty that, um, that people are reminded of. I mean, I've found in going around the country talking to people about the queen there's an almost wistfulness for um, our absence of somebody like that, somebody who does stand above politics, who, um, who embodies these kind of old-fashioned virtues. Uh, it's back to what Senator Regal and I were talking yeah. about, is that there was a time in this city that, I mean, to go way back to when you and I worked together, I wrote a book that nobody remembers with my friend Evan Thomas, oh, well, who I think they, you know Evan, right? No. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, which is called The Wise Men, yeah. which is about a group of people who understood duty and virtue and standing for something larger yeah. than the disputes you were involved in. Yeah. And we're kind of missing that in town. Yeah, and the fact that she is so implacably non-political, and, um, and that gives Does her... she have any politics? I've read some a little parts well, of the Well, she, but. yeah, I mean, she's hinted at certain yeah. things, but... We know you her know, husband you, does. Well, we know her husband does, uh, but I've talked to people in the Labor Party who say, oh, she's, she's secretly, you know, she, she really is labor at heart. And there's some, you could make an, ex, you could make an argument for that because, mm-hmm. because the monarchy believes in the power of the state and the power of the state to, to do things. And so, in a sense, you would kind of expect them to have an affinity with labor. Um, on the other hand, there are other aspects of, of, of their belief system that conforms more with, um, with the Tories. But she is very careful um, not to signal uh, her approval of one party platform or another. I mean, she very famously, and I think it's next week, she goes before the state opening of parliament, and she sits there in a sort of monotone reading that particular party. I have party's, instructed my ministers. ministers to <laughs> da 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 and these are this is the party platform we're gonna we're gonna put forward and nobody could tell whether she See, believes I think a word a, that she's saying. I think um, there is a hunger for getting above politics too. I mean oh, yeah. I do think that was part of the Steve Jobs appeal, which is okay, here's just a competent guy. I mean the uh, to I should use the word the F word twice in one night, but the onion headline when he dies was so the last person in America who knows what the F he's doing dies. Right. You know, <laughs> uh, that, that notion that we become a country that's lost a sense of duty, that's gotten too much involved in partisanship, and the competence is gone, yeah. and that's what Steve yeah. was about. Yeah, and, we, and what she is, in a sense, too, oh, no, even though in a very different oh, setting. Oh, totally different, but... But, you but know, she embodies like, all that, and mm-hmm. people admire that more than ever. The more fractious things get, mm-hmm. um, the more divided people become, they sort of look to somebody in her position, assuming she comports herself well, which she has. Um, almost no missteps. Almost no missteps. I mean, that week after Diana died was a, was a, was a misstep, but she recovered brilliantly. You yeah. know, that they, they came down, they came down a day early, memorable moment out in front of Buckingham Palace, spontaneously got out of the car, looked at all the displays of the flowers, talked to the mourning women, 
Um, and she gave that speech, which was, um, which was live. She hates to give live speeches. And it was, the one thing about her is she's absolutely authentic, and I think people pick that up. They know that she does not say anything that she doesn't mean. There's a very famous story about when she was an, a young queen and she was going up to Hull for the first time, and somebody had written a speech for her saying, I am very pleased to be in Hull. And she crossed out the very, and she said, no, I'm pleased to be in yeah. Hull. <laughs> <laughs> Should we open it up? Yes, uh, Mr. Eggers, William. Well, I have a million questions. A question I've been dying to ask both of you is, one of our mutual friends who's been a supporter of 826 out of D.C., a wonderful uh, author, Thomas Lamone, one night was uh, telling us uh, about, the, you know, he, he wrote the, Fictionalized account of Watergate, of course, sure. and um, and he, he so said, did Woodward, right? <laughs> <laughs> I won't go there. According, <laughs> according to Ben, <laughs> I won't go there. That was off the record. I cut that from the tape. <laughs> we're actually at, at we're at Hitch's house like for an, mm. an event with a bunch of authors, and he spent a while just talking about the process of writing and getting into the head of, and he said he dreamt about. Nixon's voice was in his dreams always from listening to all the tapes. And so basically for you know year or two years his Nixon was in his dreams all the time and it was that like that level depth. And then Sally, we talked a little bit about this at T one day yeah. while, while you're still writing the book. And so and you know, when I think about Franklin and Jobs and Einstein, could you talk about that process of both you know, getting in the heads of the people you're writing about, but then also maintaining an ob objectivity about them. And what does that feel like as you're, as you're writing about these, you know, great figures? I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, the way I would phrase it is, is they do, at a certain point, begin to inhabit you. And that's a good thing because, and it takes a little while, I don't know if, you experience the same thing, but it always happens to me. And one of the first clues is when they start popping up in my dreams, right. and um, and that, and and it and it just it, I think it just simp simply means that 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 I'm so focused that uh, and I don't think it indicates a bias one way or the other because you know I think one of the first dreams I had about the Queen is the classic dream that we had tea together. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody in England practically has had that dream. But, um, but it also helps me with the creative process with, you know, I'm, uh, they not, you know, sh they not only show up in dreams, but they, but they're just always in my consciousness. I'm, you know, walking down the street and I'm, you know, thinking of various aspects of their personality or character and how am I going to portray them or where I, where am I in the narrative, um, and uh, and and when the writing is really going well, you actually sort of get lost in their world. Um, you kind of you lose kind of the sense of what's around you. Mm -hmm. But all that's good. It doesn't mean you've you've lost your objectivity. It just means you are so deeply into it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're doing somebody alive, I discovered it's particularly hard. Yeah. Especially somebody really, really with a strong personality. Then you add to that doing somebody who's dying, which suddenly happened to me at the very end. And he's just so totally opened up. He was somebody who didn't have that many confidants. And for hours and hours on end, he'd be just pouring things forth to me. So your question, which is a difficult one, which I don't talk about too much, is, you know, how do you keep your objectivity. And he kept insisting, I want this to be an honest book. Put in all the flaws, all the warts. I'm not going to read it. Um, which is odd, because he's such a control freak. And I remember the last visit I had with him. This was late August or September. And he was in bad shape. I mean, curled up. And, and at the end of our long, long talk, when he said, I really want this to be an honest book, he said, um, something like, and I promise you, uh, I won't read it because I don't want to. He said, There'll be things in this book I don't like. And I nodded and said, Yes, I'm going to try hard to make it honest. And he said, Don't worry, I won't read it because I like you and I don't want to get mad. 
In fact, I'll read it, but I won't read it for another year. Mm-hmm. And he had such a reality distortion field, I felt elated, which was, he'll be alive a year from now. He just told me so. And so that's when I really got my head messed up around it. But I succumbed, and the end of the book is very personal, and in the first person at times, including scenes like that, where I just said, I can't be objective. Forget it. Uh, I'm just going to tell you what it was like sitting on the bed with him curled up, trying to find pictures of his father on the side of his bed. Yes, sir. Yeah, as, you're, as I was reading the book, I was thinking about whether, how much he... Thank you. Um, as I was reading the book, I was thinking about the question of how much he mused about the sustainability of the momentum of Apple after he was gone. Did he ponder yeah. that much? Yeah, quite a bit. Although I will, if you forgive me, um, almost every Q&A session, just like you may have the one about tea with the queen, I get very gussied up in a very complex way a simple question, which is, should I sell my Apple stock? Uh, <laughs> and I know that's not exactly what you meant. Um, I'll tell you, I mean, I'll tell you, sir, I was with him that day he stepped down from Apple. He come, he's wheeled into the boardroom, and uh, people don't know this, cause, but he was in a wheelchair, he could hardly move. And when he was there in the boardroom, everybody's really sad because he's not looking great and saying I'm stepping down. So somebody says, actually, uh, you know, one of the board members, so it's making fun of Hewlett Packard because they had that day gotten out of the tablet business, just couldn't compete with the iPad. And they were even thinking of spinning off their piece of personal computer business. And Steve said, stop. When I was 13 years old, I found Bill Hewlett in the phone book. I called him up and he gave me a summer job and he gave me the parts I needed to build it. And he and David Packard thought in their garage that they created a company that was going to last for generations. But these bozos have screwed it up. Don't let that happen to Apple. He said, there are certain companies that have ups and downs, like Disney, he said. But Walt Disney's notion that creativity has to be connected to technology, that the miracle of the imagination has to be connected to what you do at all times, those were things that were imbued into the DNA of that company. And then I, he told me this that evening. When we were just talking. I said, well, what's the most innovative, great product you make? He said, no, you aren't listening to me exactly. Making an innovative product is hard. But making a company that will continue to make innovative products, that's the really big thing, and that's the really hard thing. And I think I've been able to do that. So I'll give you his answer instead of mine. And I think my answer is, yeah, I think he was able to do that. Yeah, well, let me, and then I'll get, yeah. I, I, uh, Sally, you can call on people, too. I didn't mean to <laughs> play. I, I'm just so used at the Aspen Institute to playing moderator. <laughs> Uh, it's a two-part question. As biographers of other individuals, do you see yourselves taking on the personalities, good or bad, of your subjects? And <laughs> you mean going you around doing this? <laughs> <laughs> I never do it. No. I, didn't ask, I didn't ask you what was in your purse. <laughs> oh, or, well, or it's, it's right here, so <laughs> I've totally and identified. The second part is, who would be your next ideal subject? Uh, well, let's see. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I don't think I identify well doing that. But, um, I mean, I think you have to try and get in their heads and, under, you know, we were talking about that a little earlier, and try and understand how they think in certain situations. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I have, I've had varying approaches to the different biographical subjects. I mean... Um, You're so diverse. I mean, yeah, between I mean, the Bill Queen Paley, and Bill Paley Bill and Paley Bill Clinton. Bill was just yeah. this titan. He was this titan of, of, of the broadcasting industry, and nobody had ever really... Um, <clears throat> nobody had ever really taken him on. And, um, I mean, I knew he had this kind of, um, you know, this imperial image that he'd created. Um, the most vivid thing that brought that home to me was when I was a reporter for the New York Times and I was working on a big story about Ted Turner's um, <clears throat> effort to take over CBS and I got a summons from CBS to come and speak to Bill Paley and I thought, great, I'm going to have an interview with Bill Paley. And I walked in and I sat down and he, his office was not like an office, it was like a gaming room, which was part of his image that he projected. And uh, he was seated on, seating on, sit, seating on a sofa, and I sat on a chair across. And he had a P 
piece of paper in his hand. And he sat there and he read a statement to me. And I said, thank you, Mr. Paley. And I started to ask him questions. And he said, no, no. He said, that's it. <laughs> that's all you're getting. And I thought, wow, what has just happened to me is instead of CBS sending this statement over to me at the New York Times, I've been summoned for an imperial that's audience. That's because he always wanted and to, so, to be an imperial. And so I thought, that was the moment when I thought, I think I better write a book about him. Cool. This is really interesting. Um, my daughter sort of answered that question once about relating to people. Because uh, she said that she had read that, Emerson said that all biography is autobiography. And she said, when you were doing Ben Franklin, you were kind of writing about yourself, Dad. You know, sort of a editor, publisher, who likes to dabble in diplomacy and networker, kind of the ultimate uh, striving, you know, networker of the time. And I said, well, okay, what was uh, Einstein? And he said, oh, that's Ur, -Ur meaning my father, her grandfather, who indeed is sort of a halo-haired, engineer, Jewish, humanist, scientist type. And I said, okay, smarty pants, what was I doing when I wrote about, Ein what about Kissinger? And she said, oh, Dad, that was your dark side. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so I, when I did Steve Jobs, because she's a computer science major, and uh, I said, okay. She said, what were you doing with Steve Jobs? I said, I don't know, kind of a bratty, uh, techy person who is uh, creative but uh, doesn't know when to, you know, shut up. And she said, uh-oh, you were writing about me. So. <laughs> But it gets to what your other thing was, who would you do next? She's been urging me to do Ada Byron, Lord Byron's daughter, who was the first computer mathematician. Uh, and so I went over to Oxford to read the letters. Ada Byron is what we just talked about at the very beginning, which was the connection between poetry and technology. You know, uh, I think what I'm going to do is a book about the digital revolution and the connection of poetry and technology starting with Ada Byron Lovelace and Charles Babbage's Difference Engine, moving to Alan Turing, the people who invented the computer and the internet, and just show that theme throughout. And I'm sorry, sir, uh, you were sitting he's there. He's got a much more well-formed idea than I do. And I'll just hasten to say that um, Pamela Harriman was not somebody I necessarily identified with. I, I actually bent my tongue to say, <laughs> what about Pamela? But she was, uh, the, 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 the construct that I used in writing that book was, to me, she was as close as I could ever come to writing a, a character in a novel. She was like, and I actually had a specific Edith, Edith Wharton character in mind when I was writing that book, and that was Undine Sprague in The Cu Custom of the Country, which I think is Edith Wharton's best book. And she was, the, she was, a, she was a woman who went through a series of lives. She, she was knocked down any number of times. She was incredibly resilient. She was catnip to men. And, uh, and, and so and that was, it was sort of fun to have that notion in the back of my mind when I was, when I was writing about Pamela mm -hmm. Harriman. You could do Claire Booth Luce then. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. My question uh, has to do with chronology. Since you're dealing with biography, you... Oh. You have this person being born and they're dying, and there's all this in between. And so, how do you uh, handle uh, keeping the, the reader interested? I mean, do you parcel it out kind of mathematically, or do you wait until uh, the person is about the age of the people you think are going to be reading and emphasize that, or, or just the stuff that they have been come, become yeah. famous with and so on? Well, I think we'll make this the last question because yeah. I see people getting I mean, restless I, and all I, so. It's sort of different with each book. I mean, my, I have a sort of general principle that the further back you go in time, the less interesting people are. So I've sort of tried to com compress more and more the early life of people. Um, my biographical subjects, in the case of the Queen, um, I didn't want to kind of deal with her young childhood. So I just decided to start at the age of 10, because that was the day she learned her fate, which was to be the next monarch after her, once her father became king at, when her uncle abdicated. But um, I mean, the hardest, and I don't know what, what, what Walter's thoughts are on this, but I, you can't beat the narrative form. You simply Correct. can't beat a chronology. Otherwise, you can just get tangled up in your own You've spaghetti. You've stolen my line. That's yeah. Uh, um, you know, you, you, uh, but 
that being said, you know, within chronological chapters, I mean, I think there are planners and evolvers, and I guess I tend to be both. I mean, I plan chapters, but within the course of the chapters, things evolve in certain ways that I may not anticipate. The biggest decision for me always is about in the first third to a half of the book, which is while you're doing the chronology, is where to put the expository material. You know, the sort of, Mm -hmm. where do you have to take a little detour and explain why this institution works. Poetry and processors or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Connection. Um, As Sally said, chronology works. And this is something that the brilliant people in the academy, people who are university professors, somehow have lost. Uh, You know, there was two or three books on Einstein written before I did mine. Uh, You know, none of them were chronological. They all sort of did it by theme, you know, sort of quantum and family. When, in fact, people live their life day by day, and they grow, and things connect. Likewise, Ben Franklin, one of the great books on Ben Franklin is Edward Morgan's book of Yale. But it's not chronological. You don't know when he's born, and you don't know when he died. We shared an editor, Alice Mayhew. Do you still yeah. have Oh, no, that no I'm a random editor. Uh, well, I'm yeah. so loyal, I can't you know, ever leave Alice. But Alice Mayhew and Evan Thomas and I were doing The Wise Men, which was a complicated chronology because it was about six friends. And it starts with them at Groton rowing together crew. It ends with them telling Johnson to get out of Vietnam. So it's all chronological, but you have six people, and you've got to keep the strands together. And every time we would get a little ahead of the story or a little behind the story or flash forward too much, Alice would write in the margin a TIGTA, which stood, stood for all things in good time. Yeah. Don't get ahead of the story. Stick by the chronology. I said, what do you mean? She said, it was good enough for the Lord in the Bible. <laughs> it's good enough for you. Keep it chronological. And I thought, yeah, it's the best lead sentence ever written, yeah. which is in the beginning, comma. Yeah. So I've always tried to keep things chronological and really keep it flowing naturally so that every part of a person's life, even those parts where he gets kicked out of Apple and is in the wilderness years at next, he's still learning things, uh, you know, just keep it all in there. If the reader, if you're doing it chronologically and the reader gets bored, they know how to flip ahead a few pages. Paper is a wonderful interactive technology. You can do like that, and it's just like an iPad. The pages flip ahead. <laughs> Thank you all very much. This is Thank cool. Thank you. Yeah. You want to take this on the road? A word from 826. Well, exactly. We're going to ask Gerald Richards, the national CEO. Hey, of Gerald. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, Sally. You guys have been such great support to 826DC over the 18 months that since we opened. Um, so 826 National is a network of about eight tutoring and creative writing centers throughout the country. We Our newest chapter is here in D.C. in Columbia Heights and opened 18 months ago. Um, Joe Callahan is here, the executive director in the back here. Um, but since we've opened, we've worked with about 2,500 students here in D.C., and we've worked with about 30,000 students nationwide just this past year. And the organization is growing. Um, Dave Eggers, the writer, was our founder and came up with this simple idea of connecting volunteers with young people because young people, of course, need to write, and they need to know how to write and to write well to be successful in the country and become authors like the two of you. So this has been a great experience for me to hear about innovation and how that all connects because that's the thing we try to teach our students about being creative and that creativity is important to future success. So thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you'll find a way to support 826DC, whether it's through a contribution or through volunteering here in the Bay Area, in D.C. I'm from San Francisco, so I always go Bay Area. Um, we have about 1,000 volunteers who work with our students here, and that volunteer group is growing, and the volunteers come from all walks of life. So if you'd like to volunteer and come to the center in Columbia Heights, we'd love to have you. So thank you very much. I think Walter and Sally will be signing books in the back there. And thank you very much. Thank you.